Hello and welcome to today's webinar, Gut Health and Inflammation. My name is Bev Bromfield and I'll be your moderator for today's presentation. Before we start, I'd like to go over a few items to let you know how to participate in today's event. We've taken a screenshot of the attendee interface. You should see something that looks like this on your computer desktop in the upper right corner. You've joined this presentation using your computer's audio system by default. This means if you hear music through your computer, you should be able to hear the presentation. If you prefer to join over the telephone, select Use Telephone in the audio pane, and the dial-in information will be displayed. In addition to pre-submitted questions, you'll have the opportunity to submit questions today by typing into the questions pane on the control panel. You can send your questions in at any time during the presentation. We'll collect these and address as many as possible during the Q&A session with today's speaker, gastroenterologist Dr. Adam Stein. Since some of you may be new to the Foundation, here's a little background about who we are, our mission, and what we do. For over 50 years, the National Psoriasis Foundation has served more than 8 million individuals in the U.S. living with psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis. Founded from a tiny classified newspaper ad in Portland, Oregon, the NPF's mission is to drive efforts to cure psoriatic disease and improve the lives of those affected. After completing one of the most ambitious strategic plans in its history, the National Psoriasis Foundation launched a five-year strategic plan in July 2019. With a continued focus on a life free of psoriatic disease and its burdens, NPF remains committed to finding a cure for psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis while supporting individuals to live longer and healthier lives. NPF will focus on achieving three goals. Lead collaborative transformational research in psoriatic disease, increase the lifespan and health of individuals living with psoriatic disease, secure the human, technological, and financial resources necessary to achieve NPF's mission-related goals. By viewing today's program, you've taken a step towards expanding your knowledge about psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis, moving towards a better understanding of what it means to live with psoriatic disease. A few of the many ways that NPF supports the goal of leading collaborative transformational research includes, to date, NPF has funded close to 30 million in grants and fellowships. That includes almost $3 million in grant fellowship funding announced last July, with new awards to be announced soon. NPF grant mechanisms support all stages of research and careers. Our efforts focus on areas of unmet need and are often conducted in partnership with research stakeholders with whom we collaborate. In addition to funding outside grants and fellowships, the NPF also leads research initiatives such as the Psoriasis Prevention Initiative and the Psoriatic Arthritis Diagnostic Test Grant, which are new to the Foundation. The Psoriasis Prevention Initiative was developed at the recommendation of the Psoriasis Prevention Initiative Steering Committee, who urged the definition of prevention to better guide proposal development, and that's how it expanded to include disease relapse and comorbidities. Now in phase two of the funding cycle, MPF plans to invest $6.5 million over five years in this effort. The second initiative is the Psoriatic Arthritis Diagnostic Test Grant, which aims to develop a diagnostic test for psoriatic arthritis. Now in its third year of funding, this grant funds projects that will significantly reduce the time between onset of symptoms and a diagnosis. This is important because we know as little as six months of delay between onset of symptoms of psoriatic arthritis and start of treatment can lead to permanent joint damage. This slide highlights four NPF research efforts that you can be part of. Launched in 2015, the NPF Corivitas National Psoriasis Patient Registry, formerly known as Corona, is the largest independent observational registry of psoriasis patients in the U.S. This registry collects and studies patient health information, allowing researchers to compare the safety and effectiveness of psoriasis treatments, better understand conditions that are related to psoriasis, and explore the history of the disease. There are currently about 13,000 patients enrolled at more than 521 sites across the country. Your dermatologist may be enrolled as an NPF Corivitas National Psoriasis Patient Registry site. Not sure if they are? Ask. If they're not, encourage them to join. Citizen Scientist is a platform where you as a patient can answer survey questions, which you and researchers can analyze for trends and new insights. Citizen Scientist is currently being revitalized for greater community benefit. The LIGHT study is a real-world research study that compares the effectiveness of home versus office-based UVB phototherapy treatment of psoriasis. Entry criteria is simple. You must be 12 or older, have plaque or good tape psoriasis, and be a candidate for office or home phototherapy. There's no washout of topical, oral, or biological medications, and the study is designed to be easily incorporated into routine patient care. It's also unique because it includes equal representation of all skin phototypes. The NPF Annual Survey is a data 
collection effort the Foundation has conducted for two decades. This important research conducted each fall provides insight into the lived experience of individuals with psoriasis, including quality of life and unmet needs. If you're contacted about the annual survey, we'd appreciate your sharing your experiences with us. To achieve the Foundation's goals as mentioned, please support our mission through donations or by participating in virtual or live Team NPF events such as Stamp Out Psoriasis, Walk or Cycle events. You can learn more at psoriasis.org forward slash donate or teamnpf.org. Now I'd like to introduce you to our speaker, Dr. Adam Stein. Dr. Stein is the Director of Nutrition Support, a gastroenterologist, and an Assistant Professor of Medicine, Gastroenterology, and Hepatology at Northwestern Medicine, Northwestern University, Feinberg School of Medicine in Chicago, Illinois. Dr. Stein specializes in the evaluation and treatment of gastrointestinal disorders that involve the small bowel. Diseases such as Crohn's disease, celiac disease, inflammatory bowel disease, or IBD, fat protein malabsorption, cystic fibrosis, and more. It's possible you've heard some of these terms before in relation to psoriatic disease. It's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Adam Stein, who will present today's webinar, Gut Health and Inflammation. Please welcome Dr. Stein. All right, thank you very much, Bev. Uh, these are my disclosures. If anybody has any questions about them, uh, we can speak to that afterwards, but I'm very excited to be talking to the NPF community. Uh, full disclosure, and I did get permission to discuss this, but my uh, spouse does have uh, psoriasis as well. So I, I don't have psoriasis, but I have firsthand knowledge of the impact of psoriasis and, and how, you know, how it can affect your life. And so I'm honored to be part of this group, and I'm going to go over some ways that the gastrointestinal tract and skin when it comes to psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis are linked and hopefully answer some questions and spread some knowledge about what is happening and we'll go from there. All right, so we throw around a lot of medical terms and talks like this and I know that everybody is familiar with more derm type terms, but I just wanted to introduce some, some gastrointestinal terms that you might hear today. It's just a limited list, but uh, a list nonetheless. So when we talk about these things, you'll have some familiarity. And I apologize if, if this is too basic, but it's a good place to start. So, you know, the gastrointestinal system is anywhere from the mouth all the way down to the bottom. Uh, the anus is the last part. Uh, GI is the abbreviation for gastrointestinal, but you might it might also refer to a gastroenterologist. A gastroenterologist is like me; it's a medical provider specializing in the GI system. Uh, the small intestine, so the anatomy of the GI system, it goes your mouth down to your esophagus to your stomach, and then into the small intestine, or what's also called the small bowel, uh, and then from there it goes into the colon, or also the large intestine. So the small intestine is responsible for digestion. Uh, most of your nutrients get absorbed there. And then the colon uh, or the large intestine is responsible for absorption of water, but more importantly, packing stool so that when you have a bowel movement, you have a bowel movement in the toilet of your choice in a relaxed manner uh, and things like that. Problem is when the small intestine and the colon go wrong, you don't always have that luxury. And I apologize in advance. This is dinner time for a lot of people. This is not necessarily good dinner talk, but uh, nonetheless, it's important to talk about these things. A lot of these things are very private to people, but when it comes to your health, making some of these private things more public, meaning between you and your provider or family or whatnot, can be important. It can be the difference between health and, and being sick. So. Uh, that's your anatomy. Stool is the technical term for whatever you want to call it. Poop, feces, number two, whatever. Uh, the mucosa or epithelium is what lines the intestinal system that's responsible for absorption. Inflammation is really any irritation or injury of the surface within a body part. Uh, it can be describing the GI system. It can be describing the skin. Uh, it can be describing the lungs, different things. And then an autoimmune disease is any process where the body produces inappropriate 
inflammation or inappropriately attacks the body part, again, can be anywhere, even the skin or GI system. So with that said, let's move on. So we're gonna talk about a couple different things. We're gonna talk about the immune mediated disorders impacting the gut. So as psoriasis is an immune mediated disorder, uh, so are other things in the GI system. And we're gonna talk about the connection with the, with the gut and other parts of the body, including skin. We'll talk about potential causes of immune mediated disorders, including uh, diet. We'll also talk about the microbiome. And then finally, we'll talk about when to see somebody like me, when to see a gastroenterologist. So again, psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis, that's an immune mediated condition. Uh, in the GI system, we have several immune mediated conditions, the most common being celiac disease, as well as inflammatory bowel disease, which are things like Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. You may have heard of those terms. Uh, relatively rare, about one in every hundred uh, people in the United States have celiac disease or Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis. And for reference, uh, psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis is more common, of, uh, about 3% of the population. Now, there are other, other autoimmune conditions, but these are the three most common. So celiac disease is what happens when you have an inappropriate immune reaction to gluten. And we'll talk about what gluten is, but it's, uh, it's triggered in people who have a genetic predisposition to having celiac disease. So having the genetics for celiac disease is relatively common, uh, but just because you have the genetics doesn't mean uh, just because you have the genetic predisposition, I should say, doesn't mean that you're going to get celiac disease. However, something in the environment triggers your body to recognize gluten, which is in food, as a foreign invader, something that the body needs to fight off. And so what happens is your body produces inflammation or irritation to try and fight off gluten because it thinks it shouldn't be there. In reality, gluten is fine. There's nothing wrong with eating gluten. But in certain people who have celiac disease, the response to gluten leads to inflammation. And it can cause a variety of different symptoms. Uh, there's really no one face of celiac disease. Uh, you can have a ton of different symptoms, but it, it uh, can cause things like diarrhea, constipation, abdominal pain, weight loss, liver disease, lots of different things. So some people have advocated even screening the population for celiac disease, but it hasn't gotten that to that point yet. But it is relatively common, and people who have psoriasis or psoriatic arthritis are at somewhat increased risk of having celiac disease. So what is gluten? You hear about gluten all over the place. And gluten is a protein that's found in wheat, rye, or barley that gives it uh, this flexible quality. So when you see wheat blowing in the wind or you pick up a loaf of bread and it kind of uh, you know, bends and twists a little bit, that's because of gluten. Literally, gluten comes from the root glue, means to hold things together. So gluten is, is, is this protein and it's found in a ton of things. And honestly, things that have gluten in it are delicious. You know, all the things listed on the slide, donuts, beer, uh, bread, all these things are really good. But the problem is if this gluten protein causes you to have inflammation, which is what's happening in celiac disease, you can get really sick. So people who have celiac disease, really the only known cure for it is to stop eating gluten. And that can be very, very difficult. However, it is manageable and you can do it. Um, but gluten is in a ton of different things. So you have to modify your diet so that you avoid it. And with avoidance, the bowel and all the inflammation tends to heal up and people do fine. But unfortunately, there aren't really any other cures other than avoiding gluten. Now, the interesting thing is when you look at the mechanism of what's happening in celiac disease, which is on the right side of your screen, versus what's happening in psoriasis, a lot of the 
the mechanisms that go into producing this inappropriate inflammation are very similar. And we're going to see this over and over again when we talk about other autoimmune conditions of the gut, such as Crohn's and ulcerative colitis when compared to psoriasis. A lot of these inflammatory conditions or these immune-mediated conditions have things that are very much in common. And so it's not surprising that when you have one autoimmune condition, you're at increased risk for other autoimmune conditions because the immune system is primed to cause this inappropriate inflammation. So the skin manifestations or the skin findings that we sometimes see in celiac disease can look an awful lot like psoriasis. So this, this is a picture of what can happen when you have celiac disease on your skin. It's a condition called dermatitis herpetiformis or DH because saying dermatitis herpetiformis took me about five years to figure out how to actually pronounce it. So calling it DH is a little bit easier. But what happens is you get uh, this itchy rash. It can almost look like either uh, psoriasis or eczema. And it happens on the elbows and knees most commonly. And it's very itchy and it can be very difficult to get rid of even with creams and UV light and other things. Really the only thing that helps it is going on a gluten-free diet because that's the treatment for celiac disease. So what happens sometimes is you go in with this type of rash to a dermatologist. They don't know what it is, so they end up biopsying it. And under the microscope, it has characteristic changes of celiac disease. And then they get referred to somebody like me, a gastroenterologist, to confirm the disease. And then once it's confirmed, we start a gluten-free diet. And if you're on a good gluten-free diet, the skin should get better. So I'm not showing you this picture because I want everybody to stare at their elbows and knees, but just know that Again, these autoimmune conditions can affect different parts of the body, and they're pretty similar when it comes to the mechanism of how things work. If you do have a rash and it looks kind of like this and it's itchy and it's on your arms or legs, maybe consider talking to one of your healthcare providers about getting evaluated for celiac disease. Or if you have other gastrointestinal symptoms, maybe that's another thing to explore with your provider about getting tested for things like this. Because the treatment of, of celiac disease is a gluten-free diet. And if you go on a gluten-free diet, some of the tests may normalize. Please talk to your provider uh, before you end up going on a gluten-free diet to get tested for celiac disease first. Hopefully that makes sense. All right, next slide. There we go. So another inflammatory condition in the GI system that's somewhat like psoriasis or psoriatic arthritis from a mechanism standpoint uh, is inflammatory bowel disease or IBD as it's commonly known. And these are things including Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis. So Crohn's disease can be anywhere in the GI system, whereas ulcerative colitis is really limited to the colon. And you can have a number of different systems, but commonly people have abdominal pain, they have diarrhea, which could even be bloody. They can get a blockage in their intestine. And three out of 10 people with one of these conditions will develop uh, what's called extra intestinal manifestations or inflammation elsewhere in the body beyond their GI system. Uh, but like other inflammatory disorders, we really don't know what causes inflammatory bowel disease, but we do know that there's a genetic component to, uh, to people who have IBD. There's an increased risk in uh, family members of people who have an established diagnosis. And when we look at the cellular mechanism of what's happening, again, and I'm not showing this to teach you all about the different proteins and cytokines and all that stuff, but I am showing it because there's a lot of similarities between what's happening at a cellular level on the left in psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis, and on the right when we talk about inflammatory bowel disease. A lot of these uh, these cytokines, which are things like anti or things like TNF and IL-17 and IL-23 and things like that, uh, are active 
both with psoriasis, psoriatic arthritis, and IBD. Uh, again, triggers might not be necessarily known, uh, but the immune system is acting very similarly with both. So when people have IBD, they, they can get inflammation in other parts of the body, and it can affect a variety of different organs. But I want to point to the top left. This is important for this group in terms of what can happen. So you notice the third bullet point is psoriasis. So people who have psoriasis can also have IBD. So I tell people that if you have a diagnosis of psoriasis or psoriatic arthritis and you have symptoms involving your gut, whether it be nausea, abdominal pain, diarrhea, constipation, cramping, whatever, because there's this link between the mechanism of action in psoriasis and the mechanism of action in uh, inflammatory bowel disease, you really ought to consider being evaluated by somebody like me, by a gastroenterologist, to see if maybe there is a link between the two and you might have some inflammation somewhere in your GI system, including your vascular system, your joints, uh, your eyes, your lungs, your uh, your liver and, and your, your bile ducts, as well as your bones. So again, because these things are so common, there's a lot of crossover between the diseases and we really ought to take your symptoms outside of the skin seriously and evaluate whether or not uh, you might have another autoimmune condition. The nice thing is, uh, it's never nice to have another disease, right? But the nice thing is a lot of the medications that we use for psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis are also used for things like Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. Not surprising given how similar the mechanisms are at a cellular level that a medication that works for one autoimmune condition might work for another. Problem with celiac disease is none of these medications work all that well, and the only real treatment is a gluten-free diet. But nonetheless, uh, there are other GI disorders that could be potentially treated by one drug, and you get both skin coverage and gut coverage at the same time, which is nice. Not all medications work for both, but a good chunk do. All right, so when we talk about overlap between autoimmune conditions in terms of uh, whether it's psoriasis, psoriatic arthritis, ulcerative colitis, uh, diabetes type one, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, so on and so forth, and people have symptoms of another autoimmune condition and then are diagnosed with it, we often wonder which one came first. Was it the psoriasis and then you developed GI stuff or did you have GI stuff all along and the psoriasis was sort of the, the inflammation leaving the gut and going to another part of your organ? Ultimately, it doesn't matter which one came first. The, the bottom line is don't ignore symptoms in other parts of your body if you have it. You could just have aches and pains or you could have just diarrhea from something you ate or whatever. That, you know, that happens. Everybody gets that from time to time. But if it happens a lot or it happens recurrently with breaks in between, my advice, especially when it comes to the GI system, is have it evaluated. I, I, I often wonder if people who have other conditions, if they go and see their provider and they ask questions about the gut, if they ask questions about the GI system and, and how healthy or unhealthy your GI system is, Oftentimes, I don't think they do, uh, when in reality, sometimes you have to advocate for yourself. And if you do have uh, other signs and symptoms, speak up and, and hopefully you get referred to the right person who can do a, a good evaluation. And if you have something, get it treated so that you feel better. Okay, so causes and drivers of inappropriate inflammation. Uh, so sometimes we know what causes it. So in some people with psoriasis or psoriatic arthritis, it's uh, strep throat or maybe taking certain antibiotics that will trigger it. Uh, in my wife's case, when she gets strep throat, she gets her psoriasis. Or when she takes a penicillin product, she gets psoriasis. Uh, other people, there's no link like that. So some people we know. Celiac disease, we know for sure it's gluten that triggers it. 
uh, Crohn's disease. In some people, it's it's smoking. Smoking makes things worse. Pretty ubiquitously, or you know, sort of everybody uh, who has an autoimmune condition, stress can definitely make things worse. Doesn't necessarily cause it. We think we're not sure though, uh, but stress somehow triggers inflammation in the body and can make all of these conditions worse. But most of the time we speculate, we don't know for sure, we speculate. And a lot of speculation is happening right now with the germs or bacteria, viruses, fungus, things like that living in our system, as well as the food and beverages that we put into our body. We wonder if those sorts of things are either causing diseases or preventing diseases. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that, uh, including of the skin. So under normal situations, everybody walking around or just living has a ton of organisms living on their skin. They also have organisms in their gut, in their lungs, other things. You're exposed to the environment and the environment has bacteria and other things and they get on your skin. And most of the time, it's a healthy relationship. The bacteria that live in our skin and our gut, things like that, do some housekeeping things. Uh, they provide a nice healthy barrier in terms of keeping us safe. But sometimes the bacteria or other organisms can shift to an unhealthy state. So some research going into looking at the relationship between bacteria that are on our body and autoimmune conditions, including psoriasis, has been a pretty hot topic. And I'd encourage you to take a look at some of these articles. The references are in the bottom right hand of your screen. So this is one that came out of uh, a pretty prestigious uh, magazine called Nature. And this is a, uh, it was published uh, now two years ago, but it talks about the general aspects of the skin microbiota or all the organisms living on our skin and what happens when you have healthy microbiota and when you have unhealthy microbiota. Um, another review is from 2019 and this talks about the gut microbiota, which not may not be of terrible interest to everybody, but it is uh, a similar relationship between organisms that are things like bacteria and us. So when you look at uh, all of the different organisms in our body, if you ground us all up and you looked at the number of cells and you compare the number of human cells versus the number of non-human cells or things like bacteria and fungus, we have a lot more non-human cells than we do human cells interacting with our body on a day-to-day -day basis. And this article goes into some of the different things that influence, at least in the GI system, what types of things live there. Anywhere from where you live in the world to what your diet is, to taking antibiotics and probiotics, to even stress. All these things can go into uh, what's living in your gut that's not you. Uh, again, most of the time, the organisms in your body, including your skin and gut, are very helpful. Some of the things living in our gut help us break down some of the nutrients that, uh, that we ingest and help us digest. Whereas sometimes when those organisms go wrong, they can cause things like increased gas, they can lead to inflammation and other things. So having a healthy microbiota is very important for health and having an unhealthy microbiota can lead to disease. This is the foundation for why people take prebiotics and probiotics. The problem is we, we haven't really studied the microbiota, both on the skin and the gut, as adequately as really we, we need to. So we're in the very pre preliminary stages of learning about this. So while there are prebiotics and probiotics on the market, we don't really have a good grasp as far as which prebiotics or probiotics are good versus what really doesn't help versus what might even cause harm. We have a good understanding about what is in our gut, but we just don't have a good understanding in terms of how we can shift the relationship of the microbiota or the microbiome in our gut or skin and the disease process. So 
what ends up happening is people come in and they ask about which prebiotics or probiotics they should take. And ultimately, we don't have enough scientific knowledge to know whether or not those are uh, good or not so good for the body. In addition, we don't know how much is good for the body and when to take it in terms of during the day or how often you should take it in order to make a good scientific evidence-based recommendation. I tell people you can take it, it probably isn't gonna cause much harm, but I don't know if these probiotics are gonna cause a whole lot of good uh, and you might just be throwing away your money. So that goes for the skin as well. I just don't know if we have enough research in order to recommend a good probiotic or prebiotic for skin health uh, in order to really endorse or recommend one type of probiotic or prebiotic or another. And that, you know, people may argue with me about that. People may disagree. People may say, oh, look at this study or that study or this evidence. And I, you know, I'm certainly happy to, to listen to people who might disagree with that. But my opinion, we just don't have the evidence in order to give a really solid opinion about prebiotics and probiotics. But hopefully as research evolves and we gain more knowledge, that will change. Okay, so again, you know, in terms of the microbiota and immune mediated diseases, there's a whole lot of interaction between uh, the bacteria that live in our body and the other organisms that live in or on our body and inflammation and how there's a correlation and causation that goes into some of these things. Uh, what happens is as people move around uh, throughout the country or world, their microbiota changes and that may predispose them to having certain autoimmune conditions. We look at uh, countries that uh, are outside of the United States in terms of uh, inflammatory conditions like uh, psoriasis and Crohn's disease and other things. And in some countries, we're seeing rising incidences of that. And one cause could be bacteria that's being introduced. We just don't understand it well enough. But hopefully we have more information as uh, research continues. Uh, again, this is relevant to psoriasis, but uh, these are articles from the last few years looking at the composition of the skin bacteria and the gut bacteria and looking at people who have psoriasis or psoriatic arthritis and people who don't. So if you look at the right side of the screen, uh, you have people with psoriasis, which is the top bar, and you have quote unquote healthy people. I hate how they use that. Just because you have psoriasis doesn't mean you're not healthy, but nonetheless people without psoriasis. And you look at the bacterial composition in the gut not the skin, but just the gut in people with psoriasis versus people who don't have psoriasis. And you can see based on the colors, they don't match. There is a difference. And that's important. That's important to know. We just at this time don't have enough scientific knowledge to know what this difference means and whether or not changing the bacteria in our gut to look more like somebody who doesn't have psoriasis, if that will actually help treat or even cure underlying psoriasis or psoriatic arthritis. There's lots and lots of research going into this and I hope that one day we'll have some answers and this might be one potential therapy for, uh, for inflammatory conditions. Uh, this is an interesting study. Uh, this was published last year and this is uh, people who have uh, psoriatic arthritis uh, getting a fecal transplant or a stool transplant from people who didn't have psoriasis or psoriatic arthritis and seeing if that helped their underlying skin condition. And interestingly, uh, they saw a little bit of improvement, but more importantly, they didn't see any safety issues. So this is a real thing, people getting stool transplants for different diseases. And there's a bunch of different ways that you can do a stool transplant, but literally they take somebody's poop who's healthy or doesn't have an autoimmune condition or whatever, 
and they process it and then they give it to somebody who has a disease. Last but not least, this is just a couple articles. Uh, this Frontiers of Microbiology article kind of gives a good overview about what's going on in the bacteria or microbiota research. So diet, so diet plays a very important role in, in disease and health. It may be a factor in uh, developing a disease, or it may be a factor in worsening or improving uh, symptoms. But really, most immune-mediated diseases will not be cured by diet alone, with the exception of celiac disease. But diet can definitely help with symptoms or control the disease. Take type 1 diabetes and looking at uh, glucose control. Uh, take somebody with inflammatory bowel disease and certain foods can either help with inflammation such as turmeric or curcumin or certain foods may make symptoms worse. Say if you have active inflammation in the gut and you eat something like pizza, you might have more symptoms. The problem is you know, we just don't have the knowledge to be able to say whether or not our diet is helpful in situations. But my advice would be to keep a food diary and a beverage diary, and as, along with that, keep symptoms, uh, whether or not you're having a flare with your skin or other things, and try to come up with a correlation between food and what's happening with your body. All right, so treatment again, you know, treatment is, there's a bunch of different things that you can use for treatment, both of the gut as well as uh, the skin, and really partnering with your healthcare provider to come up with a treatment is the best case scenario. You know, first line things are good, you know, pharmacologic topical therapy, diet, microbiota, manipulation, those things can be add-ons, but you can use them to see if you get any, any benefit. Not a whole lot of science with, with diet and microbiota manipulation, but avoiding triggers is so, so, so important if you know what those triggers are. Uh, and then, you know, watch for newer therapies. There's a ton of newer therapies, new therapies coming on the market. And then just to wrap up, the bottom line, at least, you know, what I want to relay to the psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis community, if you're having symptoms in your gut, you're having diarrhea, you're having abdominal pain, something just isn't right, consider, please consider seeing a gastroenterologist because, you could have another autoimmune condition in your gut. And if you do, we've got plenty of therapies to help. If you don't have an autoimmune condition or inflammation in your gut, we still have therapies to help with some of those things, you know, irritable bowel syndrome or uh, what we call leaky gut, meaning the cells in your gut just aren't uh, attaching to each other appropriately, allowing toxins to get into your body and things like that. We can help with that. We've got plenty of different ways to do that. So. Uh, my concluding statement is a bit of an advertisement for your, us gastroenterologists, but I think we can do a lot of good. And people with psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis have increased risk of having problems in their GI system. So with that said, I am happy to take questions. Thank you, Dr. Stein. That was an amazing presentation. I think we learned quite a bit. Uh, so our first question is, how do you know if you have IBD or IBS? The reality is you have to look for inflammation. Uh, that's the characteristic finding in IBD, whereas people who have IBS, which is irritable bowel syndrome, you don't have actual inflammation, whether we do a, a, a CT scan or a colonoscopy or whatever, we just don't see any inflammation. But that doesn't mean you don't have symptoms. It's just not caused by any of the cellular mechanisms that we we went over. And, uh, but see a gastroenterologist, they'll talk to you about the different tests and things like that that we can offer to figure out if you have one or the other. Uh, but we can definitively tell by doing things like scans or we can even do stool and for other unhealthy things in the gut. Is gut health related to angioedema of the tongue? Yeah, no, not necessarily. Although any sometimes when you have swelling in your tongue, it can indicate if you have swelling, it could indicate maybe there's swelling in your gut somewhere, uh, which can definitely cause GI symptoms. And the next question, is there a specific test for leaky gut I can ask for? <laughs> uh, we're developing them. We have a few tests that are fairly accurate, but 
the best test is to actually talk to a gastroenterologist and get a good history about what's happening. Uh, you know, we talk about leaky gut, which, you know, is when the cells in your, in your GI system aren't necessarily attached as well as they should be together and toxins and other things can escape and cause symptoms. Uh, no great tests, but it's something where if you take a good uh, history about what's happening, sometimes you can diagnose it. Uh, leaky gut is sometimes referred to as either functional GI symptoms or irritable bowel syndrome, which is IBS, those sorts of things. All right. And can gut health problems cause or contribute to hair loss? Absolutely. Absolutely. So whenever you have problems with your gut, sometimes you're not absorbing vitamin and minerals as efficiently as you should. And some of those vitamin and minerals, things like iron, can be important for hair growth. So I often tell people what happens in the gut, there's about a three to six month lag in terms of hair. So a common example, somebody with bad Crohn's disease uh, or celiac disease who starts to lose their hair, I often tell them, well, you probably have ongoing inflammation in the gut that's been there for a while. On the flip side, when we fix those things, either by fixing inflammation or providing some of those micronutrients back, the hair will take about three to six months to start growing again. But there definitely is a connection between the two. That's good to know. Uh, is diverticulitis common for people with psoriatic arthritis and does that contribute to inflammation? Ooh. I don't know if there's an increased risk of diverticulitis and psoriatic arthritis and psoriasis. I don't know the answer to that question. It's diverticulitis tends not to be an autoimmune condition, so I wouldn't suspect so, but I'd have to look it up. I'm not sure. And how do I know or find out if my gut health is bad? Talk to your provider. You know, that's one thing where going over symptoms and things like that can be very, very helpful. And then based on your symptoms, we can do tests to figure out whether your gut health is unhealthy or not. And what, if anything, is the relationship between psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis and pancreatic insufficiency? Is there a relationship between uh, them? No, there's not, an, there's not a relationship as far as I know. Pancreatic insufficiency happens when, you know, either there's inflammation of the pancreas or there's some sort of blockage, you know, maybe by a gallstone or cancer, or things like that. Not typically an autoimmune condition. That's helpful. And I know you mentioned about prebiotics and probiotic. So does my prebiotic and probiotic supplement really do anything? I'm trying to have good gut health, even if I don't always eat well. You know, we are not sophisticated enough to know how much good does, if any. Uh, certainly, I don't think there's much harm in taking a prebiotic or probiotic. Uh, it might help with gut health. We just are not sophisticated enough to be able to say definitively if it'll help with your gut health. And, you know, following a food map diet helps heal ah. gut inflammation. FODMAP, so F-O-D-M-A-P, okay. <laughs> yeah, FODMAP. So these are these little compounds in food that can interact with our microbiome, with our gut bacteria, and sometimes it can cause inflammation, and sometimes it can cause increased gas and bloating and things like that. So following a low FODMAP, again, F as in Frank, O D M as in Mary, AP, uh, that can be helpful in some situations. Uh, I do recommend a low FODMAP diet and, uh, for many of my patients because it does help sometimes with inflammation, but more so with other symptoms like bloating and gas and stuff like that. Oh, interesting. Uh, and how accurate are food sensitivity tests? Oh, uh, you know, I'm very skeptical when it comes to these food sensitivity tests. Uh, there are a lot out there, and some of them can be expensive. I really just don't know how to interpret them. There isn't a whole lot of uh, scientific evidence behind them. And oftentimes it's very frustrating because you'll get back this list of things with food sensitivities, and then you eliminate who's that you're sensitive to, and you might not feel any different. Um, it's fine to get, might be expensive, but the data may, you know, might not help you as much as you were hoping for.
good to know. And last question, how much does sugar impact inflammation? Is there a difference between processed <laughs> sugar and natural sugar as in fruit? Yeah. Well, if so if you ask my mom, sugar is the root of evil for everything. Um, but there's actually some truth to that. Uh, certain sugars are more difficult for the body to process, whereas other sugars are very easy for the body to process. But when it gets in your bloodstream, the spike in sugar fall in the subsequent spike in insulin can sometimes cause inflammation, minor inflammation in parts of the body. So uh, don't avoid sugar altogether, but you know some people do feel better on a lower uh, sugar, whether it be a complex sugar or a simple sugar kind of diet. The sugar that I tell people to avoid uh, most of the time is milk sugar or lactose. Uh, that is very difficult for the body to break down. Lactose doesn't necessarily cause inflammation, but it can definitely lead to symptoms in the GI system. So bottom line, when it comes to sugar, lower sugar amounts is, are good for multiple reasons. And if you can avoid lactose, that's probably a good idea. Okay, thank you for that. And thank you for the presentation. So I hope everyone had some questions that were answered and they learned a few new things. Uh, and certainly the connection is very intriguing between psoriasis and gut health. Absolutely. And if anybody has any questions, follow up wise or whatever, feel free to tweet me if you're on Twitter. Uh, I'm not on any other social media platforms, but I'm always happy to scroll through my Twitter every once in a while, which is on your screen now. And, you know, anything I could I could answer, uh, I'm happy to do so. Uh, but hopefully you got something out of it. Great. So in addition to this webinar, you can continue to learn about psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis by listening to NPF's podcast series, Sound Bites, which is available through Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Ghana, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Amazon Music, or feed service of your choice. You can also access podcasts on the Watch and Listen site of the NPF website, which is listed here. If you'd like to hear more about gut health, listen to episode 136, Gut Health, Psoriasis, and Psoriatic Arthritis, from rheumatologist and vice Chair of the National Psoriasis Foundation Scientific Advisory Committee, Dr. Jose Shear. You can also hear registered dietitian Brittany Link in episode 121 address celiac disease, gluten sensitivity, and psoriatic disease. Contact the Patient Navigation Center if you'd like additional information about treatment options, need help finding a physician, or having issues with accessing treatments. You can contact our Navigation Center at 1-800-723-9166, option 1, or send a request to education at psoriasis.org. During July, we'll be offering a free copy of a healthy eating guide that has free recipes and tips for eating healthy. After the event, please take the survey via the link you receive after viewing today's webinar to provide feedback about the presentation and content. Tell us what you think. We value and appreciate your comments. And you can catch this webinar and others at psoriasis.org forward slash watch hyphen and hyphen listen. This concludes our presentation for this evening. Thank you for joining us to view gut health and inflammation.